but we're at the second to last module, and the last module is just a paper. So we're wrapping up this course. You've been a fantastic class. Um, and we're now going to go to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And we chose this piece. It's a very late piece by Beethoven. He was quite old when he wrote it. But the last movement is finally Beethoven's Dream, the setting of that Ode to Joy, that poem we read at the beginning by Schiller. Um, he's going to take some time to get there, and we're going to have to hear some other movements. And I have to tell you, I love this symphony. I love every note of the symphony. But the first movement is really long and abstract. There's a reason for that, but it's long and abstract. The second movement, which is a scherzo, is easier to understand, but it's still pretty long and abstract. The third movement, the slow movement, it's long and abstract. And then finally the chorus comes in, and the soloist in the last movement with this great poem. And there's a reason for all of that. And for me, I find this symphony a revelation. It's really remarkable. When I first heard it, I was very puzzled by it. And I know some really great musicians who still don't like it to this day because they just find it really too long and abstract. But I'm going to try to guide you through it and see if we can appreciate this piece and see what this late Beethoven, this is after the Fidelio, after he did his opera, we can see his forms becoming more and more abstract and romantic, um, but his passion for democracy just as firm as it ever was. Well, let's go on this journey. So the first movement, I have to explain a little music theory, and I don't expect you to completely understand this, but we'll try to figure it out. You hear something called chords, right? And a chord is three notes or more. So like this note, those three notes form a chord. That happens to form a major chord. Now, if I keep the outer two notes the same but change the middle one, I get a minor chord. So it's a minor chord, the top note and the bottom note. You don't change them, change the middle only, and minor changes to major. Three notes, three notes, three notes. So that's a major and a minor chord. You don't have to know a lot about it, but sort of get this idea that the outer two notes are the same. We just change the middle note. We change from major to minor. Now, you hear that piece might be saying C major. So you'd think that if I play a C major chord, it tells you I'm in C major. It's actually not true. A scale, a major scale, has seven notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then we repeat. So do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. And each of those, I can take the three notes above and make a chord. So there are seven chords for seven notes in a major scale. Three of them are major, three of them are minor. If I go to the minor scale, you'd think it'd be identical. It's actually a little more complex. So there's at least three chord, uh, major chords, but there's really four major chords at a minor scale, and maybe three or four minor chords at a minor scale. In the world of music, there are 12 major scales and there are 12 minor scales. But if I hit a chord, I could be in any one of seven keys. That chord could be in three different major keys or four different minor keys. So if I hear a major chord, I don't know what key I'm in. I could be in any of seven keys. If I hit a minor chord, I don't know what key I'm in. Um, it nails down a little. So why do composers, how do they nail it down? They want you to know the key, right? When Mozart says, I'm writing in the key of C, he wants you to know it's the key of C. Well, there's a couple of tricks. If I take the three notes, I don't know what key I'm in. But if I had a fourth note, that chord only exists in two keys, one major, one minor. So that narrows it down a lot. If you do that, and then put a second chord with it, there's only one key out of 24 that has that combination of notes. So you often see two chords. One of them has four notes, one has three. It tells you your key. If you have enough notes and you have enough chords, you know what key you're in. Now, most of the time, up until Beethoven's Ninth, that's what composers wanted you to do. They wanted you to know what key you're in. You know, Mary had a little lamb. And C major the way I played it. You wouldn't want Mary Had a Little Lamb to not know the key. You know, it feels comfortable. Well, Beethoven's going to play a trick on us. In the opening of the Ninth Symphony, he opens with just two notes. He doesn't have the third note in the middle. He has the two outer notes, which means we don't know if it's a major chord or a minor chord. He leaves out that middle note. Well, if a major chord that could be in seven keys and a minor chord could be in six or seven keys, then those two notes could be in any of 13 or 14 keys. We don't know. So Beethoven plays this for a while. And we're thinking, what? We don't know what key we're in. We don't know anything. And then he finally comes to the tune. It's not really a tune. It's just those two notes. It's, he just takes those two notes and turns them into sort of a melody. And after a while, the melody adds a couple extra notes. Then we finally find out what key we're in. But even when the mel melody first comes in, we don't know. So. It turns out, the first time around, we're in D minor. Now, this is a sonata movement, and let's see if we remember. 
in a sonata movement, we have the A group of themes, might be lots of themes, and then we have a B group of themes, and we might have some closing themes, and then we repeat the whole thing. Just we put a repeat bar and play the whole thing twice. Well, here we've got Beethoven gives us this A theme. Say, uh, oh, sorry, I messed it up, sorry. Uh, ah! The A theme. And then he plays the A theme. Instead of going on to the B theme, he repeats the A theme, only this time with the same two notes, he ends up in a different key. First time he's in D minor, a minor key. The second time he plays the same theme, he's now in B flat major, a major key. So he completely changes the way the melody sounds. And he hasn't gotten to the second theme yet. He's already put the repeat in. Very, very strange. And he's just telling the audience, all that you thought about tonality, key centers, forget about it. All you thought about sonata form, I'm putting the repeat in a different place, forget about it. He then does give us a B theme group, but this music is so disjoint. Um, little themes, pieces of themes. And then he comes to the end of that exposition where we state all the themes. You'd expect him to repeat everything. He doesn't even put the repeat bar in. Go straight to the development. Now, you know, development is where you take the thing apart. Well, his development is four or five minutes long. It's long. And Beethoven just lives there. I mean, this movement lasts 15 minutes. There are Mozart symphonies where all four movements together are shorter than 15 minutes. So you've got this strange exposition with the themes that repeat in the wrong order and we don't know what key we're in. And then he starts playing with it for a long time. And then he comes back and repeats the themes just like you would in sonata form. That's how you know it's a sonata form. He has a recapitulation with the themes. And that takes us to the coda. For the coda, he's going to play with the music again, and it's just as long as the development section. The coda is four minutes long. I mean, it's long, and it's free form. Very, very strange. Now, some of this strangeness he's going to refer to in the fourth movement. So we will not understand it until we've heard the fourth movement. But it is a question of, is he leaving the Enlightenment behind entirely? Has he just thrown form away? What, what's going on with this crazy old guy? Old guy is a lot younger than me, but he's, was, he was wearing on him. The second movement is normally a slow movement, but Beethoven flips it. He makes the third movement the slow movement, and he makes the second his scherzo. Now, remember scherzo. Again, let's talk about form for a second. Normally we have this, it's in fast three, one, two, three, one, two, three, too fast to dance. That's why we call it scherzo or joke. Then we have a theme, which we repeat, and then a second theme, and usually part of the first theme, which we repeat. Then we have a trio, which is the same form, and then we go, we play that minuet-like section again, but without repeats, and we're done. Well, Beethoven does a little differently. He has the first theme. Instead of repeating it, he goes straight to a second theme and then sticks on a closing theme. And if that sounds familiar to you, it should, because that's what an exposition of a sonata form is. So he's got this little sort of sonata form exposition. He repeats it. Then he puts a development section in, and then he brings it back as a recap. So he writes like a little tiny uh, sonata movement going one, two, three, one, two, three, one. So it sounds like a scherzo, but it analyzes like sonata. So say, okay, he writes a sonata. So second movement says, no, he finishes this section that should be a sonata, and now he writes a trio, just as if it's a scherzo or a minuet. He writes a trio just like you would, and then he goes back and repeats the first section just like you would in a scherzo, except, of course, what he's repeating is a mini sonata movement. Uh, we call this form what sonata, scherzo form, who knows? He's aware of form. He writes a sonata form there. He writes a scherzo, but he combines them together in a very strange and unique way. It goes by so fast, it's very hard to follow on the listening map, but you can try. It's well worth trying. But listen to it. That movement is not so hard to understand because it's got so much kinetic energy. First movement, if you get into the chaos, is delightful. But if you're looking for order and structure, it's pretty chaotic. So you just have to go along for the ride. If you don't like these movements, I'm sorry because you have to take your time to listen to them, but you're not required to like every piece written. Many great musicians have trouble with this symphony. If you do like it and enjoy it, I'm so happy because then I can share that with you because I love this symphony. And of course, the last movement, the famous movement, many people like that. But again, not everyone. Let me remind you that when we're done with this symphony, I will do. I don't have PowerPoint for this, just the lecture, but there'll be the lecture and then you have the listening maps. And they'll do another lecture for the last two movements with the listening maps. Once we're done with that, all that's left to do is this paper. And what you want to do for the paper is you want to pick an artwork or you can pick a body of art. And an artwork can be anything. It can be a painting or a sculpture, or it can be a play, or it can be a pop song. Just make sure it's long enough ago that you can give it some historic perspective. Or it can be fashion design. Uh, it could be architecture. It could be a novel. It could be a poem or a group of poems. But you find something that you like, and you take this wonderful bit of art, and you say, how does this reflect the time period? 
Now, you may have to do a little research on that time period, or you may not. If you do a little research, you'll just put a citation and put a little bibliography. I'm not going to be very picky. We just want to make sure we don't ever steal an idea. Um, and it's not a long paper, five pages, really, uh, so something like that. I think that's roughly 1,500 words. If it's a page short or a page long, I don't care. I just want to see you take the kinds of approach we took for Beethoven and Goethe and apply it to something you love. And then we'll be done. I'll repeat those instructions in the next lecture. And I just can't wait to see the papers you write and see what you write about this crazy symphony, Beethoven's Nine. Thanks very much.